Good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's event, How to Make a Better World. My name's Ben Newell, and I'm professor and deputy head in the School of Psychology here at UNSW. First, I'd like to acknowledge the Bejigal people, the traditional custodians of the land I'm speaking on today, and pay my respects to their elders, past and present, and to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are with us tonight. Tonight's event is presented by the UNSW Centre for Ideas and is part of UNSW's Alumni's Learn to Lead program. I'm delighted to be the academic lead and designer of this year's course. Learn to Lead is developed by UNSW academics and alumni who are experts in their field. And the focus of this year is on leadership for a better world. The program aims to inspire leaders to come to grips with the challenges that our changing world presents and look at what opportunities there are to improve the overall balance between human and planetary well-being. The course will develop solutions and skills to help UNSW alumni become better leaders for tomorrow's world. In short, the skills to take on the global challenges that we will hear much more about in Professor Grayling's address this evening. I'd like to extend a warm welcome to the UNSW alumni who are tuning in online from all around the world. I know that we have over 4,000 registrations for the course and the numbers are still increasing. So it's a fantastic enrollment. And of course, welcome to you, our live audience. Before we begin, uh, some quick house housekeeping. Tonight, we'll be hearing from Professor Grayling on how to make a better world, which will be followed by a discussion between UNS, UNSW's Professor of Political Philosophy, Jeremy Moss, uh, Professor Grayling, and the host, Anne Mossop, Director of the Centre for Ideas. If you'd like to send a question through to our speakers, head to the website Slido and use the code UNSW. We will endeavour to get through as many as possible. Also, please feel free to tweet and don't forget to use the hashtag UNSWideas. Our speaker tonight, Professor Anthony Grayling, will be known to many of you. Anthony is the Master of the New College of the Humanities in London and its Professor of Philosophy. He's also Supernumerary Fellow of St Anne's College, Oxford, and he's the author of over 30 books of philosophy, biography, history of ideas and essays. He's a regular contributor to many leading newspapers around the world and often appears on radio and TV. He's a Fellow of the Royal Society of Arts and a Fellow of the Royal Society of Literature. His new book, For the Good of the World, Is Global Agreement on Global Challenges Possible?, presents a stark assessment of what we need to do right now to ensure our continuing existence on the planet. I'm sure we're in for some fascinating discussions this evening. Please join me in welcoming A.C. Grayling. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Well, um, alas, of course, the great challenges which are facing our world are rather depressing ones. And we're all very anxious to know what uh, solutions there might be. And um, this book uh, tries to address uh, those issues, exploring first what those challenges are and just how serious they are. And then looking at a way that we, we the people of the planet, uh, might be able to do something in addition to the things that we know we ought to be doing already, stepping up and playing our part, for example, in um, trying to be a good friend to the planet that we inhabit, and therefore to be good friends to those who will come after us uh, on the planet, but also to um, begin to think and consider and to take part in conversations about some other things in addition to the climate challenge that we're all familiar with. For example, the extraordinarily rapid uh, development in a um, whole palette of technologies, uh, especially over the last 30 to 50 years, uh, some of which, most of which indeed, maybe are of great advantage to humanity, um, potentiating uh, our uh, capacities in medicine uh, and in daily living and in the provision of services, but also raising some important questions about the fact that these technologies are outstripping our ability to think clearly about what the consequences of their use might be, and certainly 
going so fast that we are limping way behind in any public conversation about how we should manage them. And I want to say a little bit about, about that also. So the first thing that the book addresses is the question of the climate challenge. The second is some considerations about these great galloping technological advances. And the third thing is the deficit in our world of rights and justice, the silencing of the voice of the vast majority of people on our planet so that their concerns, their anxieties about what these developments mean to them in their individual lives, the fact that they're just simply not heard and have so little impact on governments around the world, that is a problem which needs to be addressed because that is where a potential solution to our problems is to be found. So that's a, a general sketch of the journey I'm going to go on. I've only been allowed 30 minutes to talk to you, so I'm going to have to talk very, very fast. <laughs> and also because uh, um, they have the very, very great uh, uh, pleasure of uh, being up on stage at the end of that 30 minutes uh, with um, somebody who is a very great uh, expert on these matters, Jeremy Moss, Professor Moss, and uh, Anne Mossop. So I will talk a little less about the, the climate challenge, except to say this. We think we're very familiar with what the climate challenge is. We know that the, uh, the, the, the global uh, climate is warming. We know that there has been endless discussion about trying to limit the increase in the global temperature to below 2 degrees centigrade. 1.5 degrees is the target that the International Panel on Climate Change and all the uh, periodic conferences have tried to set themselves. We know that uh, governments and big corporations around the world are dragging their feet. They're way behind the curve on what needs to be done. We know, therefore, that at this very moment, it's much more like something approaching a three degree uh, warming by the mid-century. And if that is the case, that is going to be very, very serious indeed. We are facing an emergency, a catastrophic emergency. And <clears throat> the unpredictability of what would happen if there are excessive increases in temperature, you know, the kind of trigger effect from which cascading adverse consequences might flow and which we are uh, only um, you know, cursorily able to, to model, well, you know, think things could be serious and, and bad, and therefore it's terribly important that people should be alert and should be taking some vigorous action now to contribute to an uh, endeavour to solve this problem or to, at any rate, help with the mitigation and adaptation required to deal with the great damage which is being done to our planet by this uh, uh, increase in temperature. Now, I say that this is a very familiar matter, and of course we're all aware of the fact that for decades and decades now people have been calling out, scientists and others have been calling out about the danger, uh, advising governments, advising the global community to try to do something about it. But an unfortunate consequence of that is that people's eyes tend to glaze over a bit. We've been given these warnings so often and from so many different quarters that we feel uncomfortable when we hear about them again and we tend to avert our gaze. And that plays into the hands of those who want to delay or distract, who want to continue doing what they're doing, things that damage the environment, the use of fossil fuels, for example, for a little bit longer, keep the profit margins high, uh, put it you know, down the road before they really get active about implementing solutions. The world ought to be on a war footing, switching from the burning of fossil fuels to renewable energy. A real war footing, really massive combined global effort to shift the way that we produce and what we consume. Not that we want to limit production and consumption because after all, over the last 30 and more years, something like a billion people have been lifted out of dire poverty. About 500 million people in our world today who live on less than two or three dollars a day. But 30 odd years ago, it was 1.5 billion. And so that is, in its own right, a bit of a success story. But when you move people out of poverty, you don't want to tell them that they have to limit production and consumption because production and consumption is precisely what they're doing more of because they are less poor. So what we have to do is to shift production and consumption to something sustainable. Now, think of this, think of this. The uh, Amazon rainforest, we're all familiar with the fact that it's being hacked down to make grazing for cattle. Ten times the size of the county of Cornwall in England is the land area which is cleared of uh, 
uh, rainforest in the Amazon for that purpose. And it has been very well said that we could switch our sourcing of protein in our world from, for example, beef or indeed uh, uh, any kind of intensive um, uh, cattle farming to uh, eating, for example, mealworms. Mealworms are a very good source of protein and in some parts of the world they are actually a delicacy. I'm sure most people in this room now regard the idea of eating worms with a certain disfavour. Uh, and uh, the point that needs to be made about that is this, that if we were to switch our eating mealworms, um, our habit of eating, to the eating of mealworms in a way which is hygienic and, and uh, acceptable and we get used to it and we, we have, you know, sort of mealworm burgers that uh, look palatable, then that would be a very, very great deal better than finding ourselves in some few decades' time, perhaps, on our hands and knees looking for worms to eat because we've delayed and things have got so bad that we are forced by circumstance to be eating worms in a much less palatable way. It's that kind of thought which matters. And we'll come back to this question of climate in a minute. I just want to mention two things which rather dramatize the emergency uh, of uh, global warming. When you think about the fact that the rise in sea levels that the desertification of, of large tracts of the world, that the increase in the number of extreme weather events, and we've seen this year a really, really loud, shrill, ear-splitting uh, alarm uh, bell ringing um, with all the extraordinary things that have happened around the world. At this very moment, something like a third of Pakistan is flooded. Uh, there have been these incredible heat waves in China, the successive days of temperatures you know, up to 45 degrees uh, across Europe droughts in Europe and, and heat waves there. You've been uh, experiencing here uh, floods and, uh, and wildfires, uh, California also. I mean, the world is very stressed and distressed. It's a planet suffering because of, of climate change. And the impact on people, let alone all the other species and e e ecological niches around the world affected by, by these things, is increasingly dramatic coming closer and closer to home, and people are realizing now just how it will impinge on them. So I just want to mention two things. You'll be conscious of the fact that the refugee crisis precipitated by conflict in the Middle East and the refugee crisis uh, precipitated by Putin's uh, invasion of the Ukraine. You know, something like three million Ukrainians have moved out of the country as a result of that invasion. These are very large-scale refugee crises. I think of well over a million people fled from um, Syria and uh, uh, neighboring countries when that war was uh, getting going. But in the uh, extreme of sea level rises drowning the whole of Florida and large parts of Bangladesh and many island communities and many major cities on seashores around the world, those refugee crises will look like picnics. It won't be millions of people, it will be tens and perhaps even hundreds of millions of people displaced by, by uh, th that event. Moving into areas of the world already suffering, great difficulty in getting enough in the way of agricultural produce and fresh water. Those difficulties will be uh, great sources of, of conflict and, and distress. Very, very game-changing about the way we human beings uh, continue to uh, exist and try to survive on our planet. So just think of that. Imagine vast surges of many, many, many tens of millions of people desperate for food, desperate for water, desperate for succor, moving away from areas which have been blighted by the effects of, of global warming. So that's at the large scale level. At the granular level, at the level of individual people and how it impacts those lives, well, in what's called the global south, that is the poorer nations, the developing nations of the world, of course it's not all in the southern hemisphere, but it's just a collective way of thinking about um, um, poorer, more traditional societies. In the global south, the vast majority of women don't learn to swim. Many women in those societies wear clothing which would drown them instantly if they were caught in a flood. Women in those parts of the world take care of children, take care of elderly people, take care of people who are sick, have to find and provide food and, and water for them, 
and doing it in um, situations of, uh, of, of flooding or of fire or of uh, drought, of uh, collapsing food supply, landslides, you can imagine the tremendous stress placed on those individuals. And it's been pointed out that in cases where water supply becomes compromised, it is women and girls who have to go and look for fresh water. And the further they have to walk from home to find those uh, resources, the more exposed they are to assault and, and harassment. So down at the granular level, at the level of individuals, the impacts of climate change, how it affects individual human beings, and especially in the global south, women, has to be taken into consideration. This is why the need to think ahead and to plan and to find infrastructural um, uh, adaptations in expectation that there will be such stresses is now so urgent. So right across the board, from thinking about how we are to do something to try to limit the, the rise in, in temperatures and how we're to deal with and get ready for some of the dramatic things that are already happening and will continue to happen and happen uh, more often and more severely, what we need is a, a global response. This is not something that an individual human being or, or a, uh, one city or one nation, one state can do. It really does require international cooperation. And so the great question is, is such international cooperation possible? <clears throat> now, in this connection, the climate connection, and in what I'm just about to talk about, about technology, the great difficulty that faces getting that kind of agreement across the globe is a, a, a law, a pretty iron law, which has to be broken if we are to grapple with this problem and, and try to solve it. It is such a bad law that I've given it my own name. I've called it Grayling's Law. And the law says this. It says, anything that can be done will be done if it brings profit or advantage to whoever can see that it's done. So supposing you think, think for example, about uh, gene editing of fetuses. And supposing, um, and this is, by the way, completely practical. It's uh, already uh, happening. There are great advantages to it, you know, in getting rid, for example, of heritable diseases and so on. But you could imagine circumstances in which people might want to edit their fetuses so that they are six foot five, blonde haired, blue eyed, geniuses, can run 100 meters in five seconds and so on. So you might want to outlaw that because you don't like the idea of a sort of Aldous Huxley brave new world in which there are two subspecies of human beings. The ones who are six foot five with blue eyes and blonde hair and then the ones who do the work which is what uh, Huxley envisaged in that novel. But this could be a consequence, no, not, not by any science fiction stretch of the imagination, of those people who can pay for or get access to gene editing of their offspring. That could be a consequence of, of that process. So imagine that we outlaw that. Well, there will be rich people or there will be bad people. There might not be different people, but they will do this because they will be able to get access to it. It will happen because they can make it happen. So it's a law which is very, very difficult to break. Anything that can be done will be done if it brings advantage to somebody. And the corollary of that law is that things that can be done will not be done if they bring a cost or a disadvantage to whoever can stop it happening. And a perfect example of that is uh, Trump, when he was president of the United States, who um, withdrew or said he was going to withdraw the United States from the Paris uh, agreements on, on climate. You may remember that when Trump was being uh, campaigning to be elected, he held up a sign saying Trump digs coal because he was supported by the coal mining industry and voted for by coal miners. Now there's an example of something that can be done. That is a real major effort to switch from fossil fuels to renewables. And then somebody who can stop it because it's a, you know, it's in his interest to stop it, like Trump, getting in the way of that and interfering with it. So there's that law. It's a law of self-interest. It's a law which says people are not going to disadvantage themselves competitively relative to others if there's something that they can do either to get an advantage or to prevent a disadvantage. And that is the law that we, the people of the planet, have to try to get broken if we are to do something about climate, and about this other problem I'm now going to describe, which is technology. So think of technology. 
Think of the fact that across a whole range uh, from our mobile communications, uh, the internet and it, the use of it, the applications of artificial intelligence uh, systems, and now with uh, uh, machine learning and AI and the developments there, with gene editing technologies, with brain chip interfacing, you know, across a whole range of, of dramatic new and extremely rapid developments in technology, we've seen a transformative effect um, on our lives and on the world. Everybody here in this room, I would imagine, has a mobile telephone. We love our mobile telephones and we're on TikTok and WhatsApp and we're all getting very, you know, um, evolved thumbs. And we would not now be without those instruments. They've become an essential part of our lives. And yet, our possession of them has stripped us naked to the view of any public or private agency who wants to know about us. You ask yourself this question, how much did you pay? How many dollars did you pay for your WhatsApp platform or your email or your TikTok? None. You think it was free, but it isn't. You pay all the time with your personal data and your personal data is aggregated by all these platforms and sold on to uh, advertisers and political parties. Uh, there is uh, you know, big data analyses, but there are also profilings of individuals and aggregations of groups of individuals who share profilings. And those groups are micro-targeted with messaging specific to them, which other people may not see. And so the prospect for manipulation and false facts and certain kinds of nudgings uh, are vastly potentiated by the fact that we have allowed ourselves to be plugged into a, uh, a universe of, of, uh, of uh, technicality here uh, with many, many positive, but also some potentially malign uses. And we don't think about it and we don't discuss it enough, nearly enough. And that is the problem with all these technologies. So let me just give you a couple of examples. Brain chip interfacing is now a thing, it happens. And there are wonderful clinical medical applications of it. For example, um, people with Parkinson's disease or epilepsy or with very, very traumatic memories or with profound depression, profound uh, um, mood problems. These brain chip um, uh, possibilities will be of immense value in helping people who suffer in those ways. But think of this. If you can uh, help with that technology, people who suffer from traumatic memories, because you can modify the memories or, or uh, get rid of them, then, well, just drop the adjective traumatic. You can modify memories. Maybe you can make people forget things that you don't want them to remember. Maybe you can implant memories. If you can control people's moods by these uh, technologies, maybe you will. Maybe you will change people's attitudes and opinions because you can get access to this technology. Now this sounds a bit, you know, kind of rabbit hole you know, conspiracy theory, science fiction. It's certainly not science fiction because it is within the realms of technical practicality right now. The point is that we haven't discussed it. We haven't had a public conversation about whether we want it to happen and if it is going to happen, how we will manage it, what the limits are, whether there's any way of attempting to regulate it any way of making it transparent so that we can see you know, the people who have the expertise and who are uh, running these technologies, whether they're behaving themselves in ways that we would like. There's been no conversation. There's been no conversation really about the extent to which uh, AI uh, controls so many different aspects of our lives. So for example, you may very well want to have a, a, an AI um, controlled robot doing your brain surgery in preference to a brain surgeon who was quarreling with her husband last night and had too much to drink and has got a shaky hand this morning. So you may think that's a terrific advantage and that's true, could well be. But you know, it's alleged that over 90% of robots sold in Japan, which is one of the leading countries uh, in robotics, are sex robots. And if you um, take the plunge and you look up sex robots on the internet, you will find that um, in, both in Japan and in California, which is, as you would expect, another center for um, sex robot manufacture, that the sex robots in question are all very attractive looking female form, young-ish uh, looking um, uh, sexy robots, uh, which can be programmed in all sorts of ways including in some very undesirable ways, you know, with rape scenarios and so on. Well, that's a difficulty which you know, people should start to think a bit about and ask quite, quite what we want from these, um, from these new developments, uh, how we would like to see them managed. Uh, interestingly and uh, amusingly, of course, there was the question about male form 
uh, sex robots. So sort of rather hunky male sex robots, very well endowed, high performers. So you can switch them off out and just put them back in the cupboard and you don't have to wash their socks and so on. This was thought <laughs> to be a, a great potential for the female market. But as you know, women are far too sensible for that kind of thing, so that's flopped. But here we, we, we see uh, something about which uh, very little public conversation has been held, and yet already it's very uh, advanced. I mean, Westworld, you know, is, is right here in the whole of the world, really, uh, on this front. And that's just an example of how, uh, and we could go across the whole range of technologies, and had we world enough in time, had the organizers promised us breakfast tomorrow morning, we would be able to really get into all the different ways in which these technological advances are very exciting and, and you know, have a lot of positive aspects to them, but some which are concerning and which we need to explore, we need to become literate about them, and we need to have a discussion as to whether we, we want them, and if we do, how we're going to manage them. So the technology problem is, is a, a, a serious problem. And I'll just give you one more example about how this is working out. And this is the use of uh, um, uh, AI, and uh, AI-controlled facial recognition technology in the development of new weapons systems. So for the last couple of decades, or perhaps more, there have been hundreds of millions of dollars invested by the leading arms manufacturing countries, like the US and China, Russia, France, the UK, developing what are called LAWS, L-A-W-S, Lethal Autonomous Weapons Systems. Now to explain just what these are, uh, remind yourself of the fact that the drones, you know, those uh, unmanned aerial vehicles, heavily armed, with very, very precise uh, uh, and far-seeing cameras on them, uh, flying over Afghanistan and the badlands of the Pakistan borders. Those drones are flown by pilots in Nevada, in the United States of America, thousands of miles away. The great advantage for the home team is no body bags. If the drone is shot down, Nobody on the home team is killed, so that's great for them. And also, they're very, very precise instruments and uh, have the potential, at any rate, of minimizing collateral damage, that is, death of civilians and non-combatants, although that there are no guarantees. As you see, there have been some tragedies with their use. At any rate, those systems are called human-in-the-loop systems because a human being is operating them. It's actually flying them from a trailer uh, at the Screech Air Force Base in Nevada. Already in operation are systems known as human on the loop, not human in the loop, not human operating it, but human on the loop, meaning a human being monitoring the, the system, but the system is otherwise completely automatic. The uh, primary such system is the SeaWiz anti-missile defense system used by all the major NATO navies, US, French, uh, British and so on navies, have this anti-missile defense system which monitors the skies uh, around a fleet or a ship and if a hostile missile is approaching it fires automatically but somebody is watching the system so just in case it's your virgin atlantic holiday plane on the way to bali and it's off course then somebody can override it happily for you uh, and instead of blowing you out of the sky so that's a human on the loop system but what is being developed these lethal autonomous weapon systems as the word autonomous suggests are human out of the loop. So once they've been made and programmed and are set going under the sea, on land, in the air, they are completely uh, autonomous. They operate themselves. It's the AI on board them, which does the three things that a weapon system is meant to do, the three Fs, find, fix, and finish, find the enemy asset or the enemy combatants and deal with them, discriminate between uh, uh, enemy military assets and uh, non-competence and so on. And you have to ask yourself just how sophisticated the AI on that has to be. Think of, of a, um, say, a land-based such system in the dust and smoke and tumult of battle, having to, to judge whether a, a human figure stumbling towards it with its hands raised is surrendering or about to throw a hand grenade at it. How good is it going to be at that? As you know, the use of facial recognition, so the, the um, kind of technology now which tries to read people's emotions and intentions and to interpret what their behavior might shortly be, is very, very widely used in China, some parts of India, uh, and in very, very many airports around the world. They use these systems in airports to try to pick out who's going to be, who, who's a terrorist. 
Although I've always been very puzzled by that because I think we all look like terrorists when we're in an airport trying to find our plane. So, so this, this uh, technology has to be extremely sophisticated to be able to do that job well. And we, again, have had very little discussion about this. Indeed, there's very little information about this in the public domain. So another example, therefore, of very rapid, highly sophisticated technological development about which we, we, we've had no conversation. And it's something that no individual person or no individual nation can do anything about. You can't, as a nation, say, well, we're not going to be involved in, in uh, that, because that means that if other people are going to be involved in it, because they are, if, if it can be done, it will be done, other people will do it, and you will therefore be at a serious disadvantage. And this is why so many uh, of the major arms developing countries around the world are doing it. And they are diverting huge resources into developing it without our input or our discussion. So there are some examples about the technological challenge. The rate of technological change is outstripping our ability to manage it and to think about it ethically or just prudentially. And that is a big problem for our world. Equivalent in, in some respects, I think, because of the potential destructiveness of human lives, human societies, uh, as the climate challenge. Well, the final problem I mentioned is the problem of the great deficit of justice in our world. The fact that our world is a, a very, very unequal one, uh, one where the vast majority of people on our planet have no say, or very, very little say, in what happens in our world, very little say over what's to be done with the two other problems that, I, that I've mentioned. That the vast majority of people on our planet are effectively, politically, silent. Silenced because they're not listened to. Silenced because there are no conduits for their opinions and expression of uh, view uh, to, to be heard and to have a real effect on governments around the world. Even in countries like the US and the UK and Australia and others where uh, we think of ourselves, we pretend to ourselves that we are democracies. And we, we, we have some of the institutions of democracies, but whether in fact uh, the, the uh, genuine informed will of the, of the uh, people is what prompts the governments constituted by that will to act in a way which really serves the interests of everybody not just of, the of those who voted for you or some political faction or some ideological uh, uh, set of aims, but really acts as a servant of the people's interests and therefore recognises that it's in the people's interests to join together with other governments acting in the interests of their people so that ultimately the interests of everybody on the planet are served by agreement, by joint activity. Well, this lack of a voice, this, this lack of access for the, for the vast majority of people is a function of the fact that uh, they, in too many places around the world, um, sim simply don't have the, uh, the degree of, of civil liberty in some cases, the, the uh, ability to um, do what is necessary to make a democracy really work. That is, to be well informed, safely informed, not to be allowed just to be left in their uh, prejudices and so on, but uh, invited, challenged really to think longer and harder about choices they make and the interests of others in their society and around the globe. In other words, um, deliberative democracy. I really do invite you, if you haven't come across this concept before, to look it up on the internet. Mr. Google will tell you a lot about uh, deliberative democracy. It's a very interesting concept, been uh, developed in the first instance by um, some, some people, uh, um, in fact, at Stanford University, but it has now become increasingly uh, widely discussed. The idea of uh, taking a group of people, or, you know, if you have 10 people, let's say they're going to be 15 opinions, one of them is going to want to be the boss, they're going to start quarreling with one another and throwing things at one another, uh, if you just leave them up to their own normal human proclivities. But the technique of deliberative democracy is to provide information and to say, right, we're going to start by looking at the information and then we're going to put down a few ground rules, which is that we're really going to listen to one another. I mean, we're all conscious of the fact, aren't we, that the, the world's problems come really from people not hearing what other people say, what other people mean. Certainly all domestic problems come from not hearing what your other half is saying and, and meaning. Um, but, you know, the deliberative democracy process is one which is specifically about listening before you talk, before you put your own opinion forward. Get some information, listen, 
listen to opinion, listen to the case somebody can make, the justification they can offer. And empirical studies of these processes show that at the end of the process, groups of people become like juries, actually, with the same kind of uh, um, outcome as with a jury in a court of law, they become much, much more mature-minded about it and much, much better judges. And they change their views and they come to joint conclusions which are, on the whole, rather more positive than the ochlocratic, anarchic situation that they start out in and which is the normal condition of people who don't have a chance or give enough time and effort to thinking about things. Deliberative democracy, making, making democracy real. Do you remember what Mahatma Gandhi said when somebody asked him, what do you think of Western civilization? And he said, I think it would be a good idea. Well, I, I think this is about democracy. He said, what do you think of democracy? I think, well, I think it would be a good idea if we had it, you know, even in those countries that imagine that they, ha they have it. Because we haven't quite got it. And if we did have it, and if we could listen to people all around the world, if we gave ear to the needs, the concerns, the anxieties of people to whom we provide safe and reliable information. Not, if you don't mind my saying, Murdoch-style information, but genuine information about things. Then there would be a, a hope of, of getting that voice to make a difference, to have an influence. Because in the end, our only hope for dealing with the climate challenge and with the challenge posed by the potential misuses of technology is democracy. And I kind of end on this point now that, that the, that seems to be a, a very feeble kind of solution and, and a very unlikely one. You think, oh God, you know, the planet's going to, in a disastrous uh, trajectory and uh, we're going to have democracy to solve it. It's a bit like saying you're in a bus which is falling off the end of a cliff and the solution is to eat a sandwich. Well, it, it, it does seem a counsel of, of despair. But if you reflect on it a bit longer, you will see that actually it is our only solution. It is a possible solution. It could be made to happen. If we were all energetic enough to try to encourage ourselves and our neighbours by word of mouth, by involving ourselves in the right kinds of, of activism, to, to get all our fellows in our own towns and, and cities, our own societies, and eventually across the planet, to work together in this fully conscious and, and, and uh, um, rational way on the premise of the uh, of knowledge of the real difficulties that face us, that th th there could be a positive change in our world. I will grant you that it's unlikely, that it's improbable. Um, I, I, could, I could put the point by saying this, that there will be a dramatic change in the way that humanity uh, relates to this world of ours during the course of this century and the next century. There will be. Now, either it will happen because we get together and we start thinking and we try to be clear-minded and we try to work together, or natural catastrophes will force it on us in ways that are much, much less palatable. Changes will come. We have a choice. We either do it rationally and uh, prudentially, or we do it perforce in the midst of floods and earthquakes and starvation and eating worms. So. That's the choice that faces us. That's why I say that uh, the, the democratic solution is the one that we need to go for, however unlikely it might seem. So I leave you with that thought. I'm sorry uh, to be um, a, a little more depressing than usual, but uh, our world is being challenged. Thank you very much. Thank you so much to Anthony. We, we might be depressed, but I do feel we're depressed in quite an energetic and engaged way after his wonderful introduction to these problems and some of the potential solutions. We're joined, uh, of course, by Jeremy Moss, a Professor of Political Philosophy here at UNSW. He's the author of several books on climate change, including Carbon Justice, the Scandal of Australia's Biggest Contribution to Climate Change, to climate, change climate Justice Beyond the State, climate change and justice. He's the director of something called the Practical Justice Initiative, and so um, has a really, brought a really interesting perspective to questions about climate change and to what a philosopher in the public realm 
um, can offer us to help us think through, through those problems. So I'd like to get um, Jeremy's response to, to, to what the points that Anthony has set out, and in particular, your view of how important it is to have as an, something as an ideal in, in the, that sense of that ideal of genuine democracy, and how important values are in, in how we think about this. Well, thank you, Anne, and, and thank you to Anthony for, for giving, this, giving us this uh, wonderful book. And one of the things that I, I found really striking about it and, and which, uh, with which I, I, I agree is the case that uh, the book makes for the importance of having a, a framework of values that guide us when we're looking at climate, when we're looking at inequality or technology, having a, a clear sense and a justified sense of uh, who benefits and who, burdened, who is burdened by whatever pathway we take in response to these kind of issues. And, and that, to me, is absolutely crucial uh, part of the public debate and the public response to these kind of problems. Because if you don't have a clear set of values, then uh, I, I think you run the risk of uh, misallocating resources, of creating responses and uh, societies that are unfair. And also you, you run another risk, it seems to me. And, and this is particularly true in the climate case. Uh, because if we don't devise a fair response to climate change, then not only is that bad in itself, but you run the risk of people not accepting responses to climate change because they're unfair and they're perceived to be unfair. And, and I think that's, we, we run the risk of having a similar sort of reaction uh, that uh, uh, Brexit is characterised by, people feeling left out, disenfranchised and, and so on. So having a clear set of values is very important for that reason. And, and I think it's also important because even if, uh, like this is something, unfortunately, philosophers earn it, learn at a, a young age, that uh, if you have a set of values, they're often uh, not fully realised, but nonetheless, they can still function as a guide, even if the solutions you're choosing uh, are second best. And, and one other thing that I thought was um, uh, a terrific contribution of the book was to show how injustices, say, in the climate space, were compounded by injustices uh, in other spaces. So uh, the disadvantages um, that, that Anthony referred to suffered uh, by women in the global south, for instance, make them even more vulnerable to the kind of um, disadvantages that, that climate will bring. If we look at, at the point where Anthony finished, which is this really important discussion about democracy and perhaps um, a little bit, I think a little bit about the Australian context, and we've got some great questions coming in from you. Um, Stefan says, what does it mean for democracy that has taken this long to act on climate change when polls have for years consistently ranked it as a leading concern? And I think this is a really interesting question because it goes to the nature of, you know, any comments either of you would like to make about do we have in Australia something that appro approximates genuine the kind of genuine democracy that we've discussed, but also to think about uh, the second part of, of Grayling's law, where things will not happen uh, if there is someone um, to, to whom that, um, you know, on whom that imposes a cost. Um, and so perhaps some, some commentary from, from both of you on, on, on how we can look at Australian democracy, but also perhaps, Jeremy, you've done a very good job of outlining the kind of forces that are, that are arrayed against action on climate change, you know, even when democracy is, is, is calling for it. Uh, well, yeah, look, I, I think, so two, two things about democracy. Uh, I think we, we have to pay uh, attention to it being present at all levels. So uh, I, I don't need to tell this audience that we, we've had a, a, a tremendous uh, a sort of barrier to climate action by, by uh, the, the, the past federal government. Uh, however, I think there was ample evidence of, of democracy or, or at least some, some um, good signs about democratic process uh, at, at lower levels of government and lower level of activity. So uh, Australia, for instance, didn't have a robust net zero target with the last government. 
uh, officially at least, but we had one de facto because all the states and territories had some sort of target. And, and I think that's, I think, a positive sign. And the other thing I think we, we need to uh, think about when we think about democracy is, is making sure that everyone is subject to it. Uh, obviously, this is a, a focus of my work where I try uh, and, and articulate, I suppose, how some of the, the bigger fossil fuel interests are escaping the kind of scrutiny that they should be subject to. So bringing everyone in um, to what we're focusing on when we talk about democracy. Yes, I mean, and uh, brings up a really, really interesting, striking consideration, which is that you get large majorities of people in polling saying they really want something done about the, the, the climate problem. And then you see governments, national governments generally, dragging their feet. Uh, and this is, of course, because uh, um, national governments are formed by political parties that happen to have the majority in the legislature. And so their interest is uh, in ensuring that they get re-elected if they can. So the, the political cycle is very short-termist and they're going to act in the interests of those who are major supporters mainly donors, big companies that are supporting them and their constituents. And so they are very leery about going too far, too fast on the kind of, of uh, um, uh, public policy uh, which would be of a disadvantage to them for, for that reason. And this is why and I very, very much uh, appreciate and, and agree with the work that Jeremy has done on the subnational level. So that there are other levels like, for example, here, at the state level or the, the level of organizations in society and as I was saying there the idea of promoting citizen assemblies using these techniques of, of deliberation which could if they were formed and if they were a lot of them around the country have a big impact on the political process on the whole public policy debate about this I think so I'm, I'm very very much in, in favor of that kind of idea and I think I think probably that's where we have to go because we, we are locked into this very, very sclerotic, uh, you know, kind of politics in our so-called democracies, the Western democracies, and we need to shake that up, need to do it as soon as possible, because otherwise, as I say, nature is going to do our deciding for us. Um, if we look, so we thought, thought a little bit about democracy at the sub-national level, um, and in the book, Anthony, you're talking about um, you know, a vision of genuine democracies cooperating on a global level. But there are other forces and entities that are outside, that are very powerful, that are now outside, effectively outside those, that framework of nation states, um, however genuinely de democratic they are or not. What, does, what would your ideal model tell us about how to, how to, how to um, manage, you know, the, the, those the kind of, you know, we refer to as fossil fuel lobby or that Jeremy refers to in his work as the carbon majors, these enormous companies that are effectively a network of interests beyond the reach of, of most national governments. Yes, I, I think that, you know, this is one of the great problems of our and recent times is that these uh, super national organisations, big, very, very wealthy, um, multiply located uh, uh, corporations have so much muscle and they, they seem to exist quite outside the sphere of control of governmental, political, public policy control that we would ideally like to see any national entity under. There is a second problem, which is the, the media around the world too. So um, you get uh, you know, uh, uh, multiple media ownership, like sort of the Murdoch media empire, pushing a very, very, um, you know, definite kind of political and economic agenda uh, and influencing a number of different national governments because of its reach. So now both those cases, it's not, it's, if there were genuine global ag agreement among governments around the world to bring these two outlying, you know, uh, um, beasts to heel, the, the supernatural corporations and the multimedia outlets, it could be done. It's, it's not impossible. There is a way to do it. It's necessary because at the moment, of course, the, the, uh, the big companies are associated with the, big, the 20 big polluting nations around the world. And the, there has to be a concerted endeavor to deal with them because, again, no individual government is going to be able to do it. Did you have anything to add, Jeremy? Or? 
Um, well, yes. Um, so I, I think there's, uh, there, there are some sort of positive signs. I, I, I agree with um, what Anthony was saying. So I, I'm told that uh, as of last week, actually, in France, it's now illegal for fossil fuel companies to advertise in, in certain ways or advertise the, the merits of, of their wares and so on. And I, I think those sorts of things are, are what we have to think about and have a debate about whether or not we're prepared to put uh, restrictions on uh, the freedom of speech of uh, individuals and corporations uh, in respect of problems uh, like, like climate change. And, and I think we, we ought to think about um, some of those measures because it's very per pervasive, I think, the, the influence that that kind of advertising can have. And Actually, and if I may say, that there are in fact some instruments available to national governments or to um, you know, bodies like the EU. The EU, for example, um, makes it possible to prosecute people for corruption, unethical behaviour of, of, by companies elsewhere in the world. Mm -hmm. So if there's a corrupt activity in Angola, let's say, with mining there, those people can be prosecuted in France or Germany. Now, this is one way to go that if people are polluting big time somewhere else in the world through mining or uh, you know, um, putting poisonous substances into rivers and so forth, that they, if the corporation is present in a, in, in a country where this facility exists, can be prosecuted in that country. And that would have a very helpful restraining effect on some of them. And uh, even more encouraging than the ban on fossil fuel advertising in France is the fact that the city of Sydney is now also considering and discussing a similar issue on the enormous amount of advertising that they have on our bus shelters and the like. Um, we've got a question from Toby Walsh, who I must uh, uh, tell Anthony, one of the leading global experts on lethal autonomous weapons. Um, but in this case, asking us a question about democracy. Democracy has two fundamental problems, the tyranny of the majority and its failure to take proper account of externalities. How do we fix this? A simple question. <laughs> well, on, on the first point, uh, it's a, the, the concept of a majority is a, is a very interesting one, given that no, no nation, no state, no society uh, has any natural majorities in it at all. And any society is just a great conjuries of minorities and individuals. And what happens if you have a very artificial thing like a, an election and some political parties offer a manifesto? You get a very temporary coalition of minorities forming a temporary majority with respect to some issue or, or, or some uh, set of, of proposals. And the, the idea that there is a natural majority in, in a country for this, that, the other, is a very misleading one. It's a misunderstanding of the way of the sort of complexity and diversity of society. And therefore, really, the reason why it is so much better if the systems, electoral systems, the constitutional order of, of a country is such that the legislatures that are elected by it are themselves very diverse and represent a lot of different interests. So a really proportional representative system of election, um, coalition governments, you know, I'm going to give you an example. Last year, there was an election in the Netherlands, and the Netherlands is a highly PR system of voting, much, much more even than, than here. And they have lots and lots of political parties. So the election took place in the spring, in about April time, and they formed a government in December. It took them that long, all the discussion and negotiation until they formed a government. And a lot of people pointed at that and they say, oh, isn't that terrible? It took them nine months to form a government. I think it's a damn good thing because it meant that they were all sitting down looking at what the real priorities were, what they could all work together on, and they were all bringing in these voices from the different aspects of society, and finally came up with a government and a program which they agreed to implement. Now, providing you know, there isn't too much personality and egoism and, and party political ambition involved, providing you have mature-minded people, which is never guaranteed, of course, then you would get a, a government which is a servant of the people and not an attempted master of, of, of the people in order to get a partisan agenda through. So we're talking ideals here, it's all a bit utopian, but if, if, this, was how things, if this was how things were, then you would get, I think, much, much uh, better expression of what the sentiment in a nation really is, and therefore much better public policy. 
Jeremy, do you want to pick up that question about externalities and how, you know, can democracies ever cost externalities? And in particular, that question about so many of the, in so many environmental issues, whether it's carbon or ecosystem services, clean air, clean water, you know, the fact that we are not factoring in either the, the costs or those benefits. Look, I think that is a very good question. And I think democracies have a problem with, well, particularly our democracy has a problem with this on, on two levels. Um, we, we just don't think about the kind of externalities that uh, we're imposing on, on our own population. But certainly in relation to climate, I, I think we're not thinking clearly enough and thoughtfully enough about the externalities that we're imposing on other populations. And we're doing this in, in two ways. One as a producer and uh, exporter of fossil fuels, but also as consumers. So we're, we're at both ends of the supply chain for, for different uh, kinds of uh, externality producing activities. And uh, I think lots of countries, not just Australia, but say, you know, Norway even, uh, the USA, Canada and so on, lots of developed countries uh, need to take ownership of the kind of externalities that they're imposing on others. Again, this is an interesting, very interesting conversation uh, f for us to have with two philosophers. Um, uh, that when I was uh, talking to, to Jeremy prior to the event, he pointed out to me that philosophers have the habit of uh, thinking that good arguments will carry the day, um, which is certainly we're here tonight to listen to these good arguments, even as we think, sadly, perhaps they will not, uh, not necessarily carry the day tomorrow in the real world. Um, certainly not without efforts from all of us. We have a question from Jan Felix. Do you have any practical suggestions for organisations, companies, and I think we could expand that um, to, to, to all kinds of organisations and people, about how to create a culture that breaks Grayling's law for a better sustainable world? So how do we uh, break out of um, that trap of self-interest? whether it's individuals or organisations? Well, of course, you're, you're right that the, um, the great problem with philosophers is that they do think that reason will, will uh, sway. And we uh, know that... Maybe I, I was in, wrong saying it's a problem. The charm of philosophers. Uh, oh, the charm, well, it, it's kind of charm in a way, I suppose. But, uh, you know, it's emotion, it's feeling, it's sentiment that really does, uh, on the whole, motivate people and... and what you've got to do is try to educate the sentiment, educate the emotion. One way of doing that is a combination of, of reason and narrative. You know, we're very influenced by stories and we can be moved by, by um, coming to see how at the individual level the, the, these problems express themselves. And if you can get people to, to understand at that level, not just at the cerebral, but at the sort of gut level, of, of what's going to happen to people, what, what effect it might have, and give people a motive uh, to want to see the world work differently and to talk to other people about it and to communicate their sense of anxiety or interest or, or uh, urgency, then within a group, so within a company as it might be, or within a, a party or a community or a nation, and then perhaps in the world as a whole, you could get a great swell of sentiment that wants to push everything in a certain direction. And in fact, I suppose in, in a way that that's what I was suggesting, that if we were able to give people a voice, if we were able to bring people together and, and uh, communicate to them in a way that really sort of bit, really took, that people would want to, to work with others to solve problems, to solve these problems uh, and to help to make things better. Again, it's a bit utopian, it's a bit idealistic, but it's not impossible because it does happen in certain circumstances. Think, for example, of the way a nation will come together in wartime. Think of the sort of blitz spirit. Well, you know, the whole world is being blitzed now by, by these problems, and we should see that and understand it. And once we do, maybe we can, we can get together like the people did in the blitz and do something about it. Um, Jeremy, anything to add on this whole question about how we create more altruistic cultures? Uh, well, uh, just picking up on, on something that uh, Anthony was saying then is 
what strikes me is is the importance of joining in, as it were. It sounds a bit sort of you know, Boy Scoutish in a way, and but uh, I, I do think that's uh, how both uh, what good solutions look like is is people joining together to um, uh, combine their, their their powers and interests uh, uh, to to make changes. So I think that's. Um, something that is uh, a key part of, of moving forward. And if we look at that question about those, the, those two examples about joining in or but potentially this idea of a war footing, uh, how do you achieve that without that being in opposition to other groups? <laughs> I mean, w w one, of, one of, you know, those examples about bringing people together, very often it, when we've seen it happen successfully in the past, it's been in opposition, in order to fight, not... Uh, 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 you know, to fight other groups of people rather than rather than to tackle problems in this more, you know, common way. I think we're going to start sounding like a stuck record here, but it really is a is, is a matter of um, to put it this way: in in the in the UK in the Second World War, there was a government of national unity with a single purpose, which was to you know defend the state and defeat the enemy, and to you know put all the energies of the nation together to do this. So there is a model. It shows that it's possible. Maybe, maybe if the war went on for, for too long, it would start to fray and fall apart and everything. But at any rate, there is a model, an example. It can be done. Of course, there will be people there who, you know, free riders and the people who profit from a bad situation. Bad situations are always opportunities for somebody. So, you know, that can happen. There were black marketeers and so forth. But in general, the nation kind of pulled together and, and, and they did what was required. That same spirit, that same energy is required now. What we really need is, you know, what, uh, um, I, I think probably Jeremy and I will remember that uh, what one of the great figures of our tradition, which is Bertrand Russell, was a believer in, in um, world government. I'm not personally, because just imagine if world government were run by Boris Johnson or Scott Morrison or somebody, <laughs> that would be too good. So it's good, that, it's good that we don't have world government, but what we do need is world unity on these issues. We don't have to have world unity on every issue, but on the really, really key issues, we need to see that. That will only happen if individual governments are really prepared to work with others and to uh, subordinate national interests and partisan interests to the general good of humanity. Like the Blitz, I think really that's probably the best model that we can come up with. And, and you know what Jeremy says in his book and just said now what, what I think it really is a matter of people coming together and by the way the power of word of mouth of people persuading one another of stopping people in the pub or you know over the dinner table or at work in the workplace in the supermarket saying you know we, we really we should do something about this we can do something about it individually I mean alas alas it's just simply true that if each individual human being on the planet started to recycle and you know recycle and cycle okay those two things uh, it would be it would make a, some kind of a contribution but it wouldn't solve the problem it really needs to be very large scale there's got to be a huge shift from burning fossil fuels to renewables changing the way that we uh, produce and consume we've got to think about genuine sustainability and, and in, you know, just all these little, little individual things um, won't do it. But little individual determinations to try to get the global shift. Now, that can be something effective. If each one of us thinks that we can put a little pixel into the picture, the overall picture, and we can do it by our own individual action and by talking to others and trying to work together with others to write letters, to be an activist, to get out there on the street when it's necessary, to do something, that could start to shift the needle a little bit and we could see, we could see the world, the people of the world, the people of the planet, at last having an effect. Jeremy, a closing word. Uh, well, I, I think that those, those words are very good ones to, to end on, which is, uh, as I was saying before, the, the, the importance of uh, doing things collectively in, in order and trying to ensure that collectives are diverse collectives as well. Uh, as I, I noticed uh, this week, I think, or last week, the, the Australian Council of Trade Unions, the ACTU, was calling for a, a climate transition authority. 
And uh, I thought, oh, yeah, this sounds like a good idea. And I think I thought it was a good idea because I probably had the same reaction that everyone did, which is, yes, and I, I could be on that. And uh, <laughs> I, I could really contribute. Um, and, and of course, I'm not going to be on it. Uh, and most none of us are probably going to be on it. But it, it does show that we, we have to ensure that whatever authorities or groups that are set up really do have the, the right and a diverse group of people on them. Thank you to both of our speakers. Uh, thank you to you for all of your questions. We have only got through a few of them and there are many other interesting questions here about you know, making the most of the knowledge of indigenous people, about questions about AI. So, so many interesting things as part of this conversation. Um, it's always really interesting in these discussions to see what comes in in terms of questions, uh, uh, that, that people are often wanting to take something away about what could I be doing in my life tomorrow towards these greater goals? And it's really interesting to have had this conversation tonight about how uh, we do have to be thinking about things on a, on a global scale and that our biggest individual contributions are in that form of collective action. Um, although, of course, recycling never forbidden, um, but, but, but we need something, something that brings us all together to make those kinds of changes. Um, thank you for being part of the conversation. Thank you to the UNSW alumni, part of the Learn to Lead program. I, this is a really big conversation about some of the challenges we face and what some of those solutions are. And I know that over the next few weeks, the people doing that course will be having lots of interesting conversations and about how to enact um, some of the things that we've been talking about in their work and in their lives. Thank you very much for joining us here tonight, our live audience. I hope to see you again at, at more Centre for Ideas events. Um, to, to find out more about what, what's coming up next, please subscribe to the UNSW Centre for Ideas newsletter or visit centreforideas.com. You will have seen that the wonderful UNSW bookshop is in the foyer and our speakers will be signing uh, their books tonight. But I'd like you to join me to thank, in thanking AC Grayling, Jeremy Moss and Ben Ewell, of course, our introducer. <laughs>